So I've been playing around a little bit with ancient odysseys. This is described as a uh, an introductory role-playing game and I also have so this is the main book the first book treasure awaits I also have the the second book more treasure awaits and they work very nicely together to provide I would say more of a pen and paper dungeon crawl structure than an overall actual role-playing game that seems a little too grandiose for what the material is you can see they are small paperbacks the format is um, unusual in a way for um, certainly for a role-playing game because of the size for an actual entire game but it is I've been bringing it back and forth to work and playing it at lunch and it's been quite enjoyable as a small format uh, foundation for doing a dungeon crawl in the fantasy world and I'm going to just show you a little bit about what it is and what I've done. It is a pre-programmed dungeon crawl that is included in this book and I'm not going to show you too much about that because if you play it yourself I don't want to ruin that for you. The second volume which includes some rule book or rules I should say for uh, more like overland adventuring and things like that also contains a pre-programmed adventure and I haven't yet played that one. Um, but let me show you a little bit about what the main characters are that you can create and the attributes and how the system works. I'm going to show you the design credits here for the material. I did receive a copy of both of these books from the designer and I'm not going to go through the details of character creation for example. It's pretty standard uh, characters that you have, races and such. I chose to play an elf wizard a, uh, I added a Pathfinder Elf because the Pathfinder race comes in in the second volume and I didn't see that initially and wanted to play that because I wanted to give a companion to somebody. I like to always play with some animal companions. I got him a companion hound and I have a dwarf warrior and a hobbling wizard. So I've got a couple of wizards a pathfinder and a warrior. The main attributes are in fitness, awareness, and reasoning. And then you choose four pursuits for your characters. These are basic skills and various levels you're rolling. Uh, it's a d6 roll and then you get the modifiers based on that. You as a wizard get some spells of course and um, you get some basic equipment such as a knife to carry. Everybody gets an option of carrying something like a torch or a rope. So as you can see this is fairly standard fare. We have for example our warrior is going to have a skill of axe fighting and brawling and melee and sword fighting. Nothing too unusual there. What's useful about this from the perspective of a solo player is that there are throughout there are little d6 tables that you can use so here we'll look at this armor table for example it will tell you based on the vocation that you have chosen and the d6 roll for example what type of armor you will be receiving and then it will give you some modifications to the rating so this can be helpful to quickly create characters and run through with a little party here I think when playing a game solo it can be challenging with the heavy rule set to come up with character well for me at any rate to create even more than one character sometimes depending on how heavy the rule set is but this is really fast and so you can give yourself that variability Let's just take a look here at uh, what the second volume offers I can't remember so we've got clerics and pathfinders in the second volume and there are a few more skills or pursuits that are provided also with uh, bartering for example and this is something that I added in after I had originally set up because I always like to give myself the opportunity to perhaps negotiate or barter with a monster or an NPC that I encounter instead of just going straight to combat so that came in here in the second volume. There is, because it's a relatively light rule set, 
uh, at least when I've been playing it, I've added in some of my own, I'll call them house rules, or just rules that aren't there for the different ways in which you might approach a, an encounter. And in the rules that I have been using, you can at least initially attempt to, always attempt to uh, bargain, negotiate, or perhaps extract information from the encounter or the uh, monster, the character that you are encountering at that moment. Now, coming to the question of encountering information and any type of larger structure or story, I am going to be and have been as I've been playing, bringing in pretty much two of my standard fare for doing this, the classic dungeon design guide and my tome of adventure design. These are my two go-to resources for giving a larger structure to the story and the scenario, in this case the basic dungeon crawl that I am running here. And I will show you now how this actually works. So we're moving back to the basic game and again I'm not going to show you too much because it is a basically it is a choose your own adventure well, it's not exactly choose your own adventure. It's it's creating a dungeon crawl, a pen and paper dungeon crawl, really, following and going through the room. So let me not show you too, 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 too much here. But the book gives you, after it gives you the rules for setting things up, choosing your spells, etc., it will tell you it's time to enter, enter the dungeon. And um, this is, there's a light story here. You're searching for a lost child and you are reading your basic story here and then, see how I can show this to you, entering the first room, which is a twisting corridor. It gives you a little bit of information about the uh, physical environment of it. It is lit by torches along the walls, but it's otherwise empty. And then it gives you the environment to go through and turn to these various areas to see whether there's a trap, whether there are creatures, and whether you will find loot, and a small suggestion of a map. So based on that, I have created my own corridor, my own twisting corridor, and I have begun to populate it with environmental, uh, environmental things and other story elements. So this is my twisting corridor that I created and then I used my supplementary material to come up with some more atmospheric things. There's floating ash, there was a, um, an archway of skulls, there's going to be a clearing area here and they, um, let's see, what else do I have here? There's a flagstone floor that's damaged and things. I, so I've made some notes here in case I ever want to go back. We did search for traps and Mr. Peabody, for those of you that watch my channel know that this is Mr. Peabody, who's often my wizard in games. He apparently did find and um, de detrap a trap, disarmed the trap. And that impacted the remainder. Again, I'm not going to show you too much here. That impacted um, what happened moving forward. In this first room, we did encounter a goblin thug, and he went after my warrior first, and we attempted to get cover and hide. Now, this is where, when I populated the environment with these were some pillars that came up. Um, I gave my party an opportunity to hide and rolled on the, I think it's the stealth table, I can't remember. There's a table in the book that tells you whether or not you successfully do this. And um, the warrior did hide, my wizard did not, the uh, pathfinder did, and as did the other wizard. So this impacted how the combat came out, they grappled, there was melee combat with my warrior and this goblin here. They grappled with each other and basically exchanged blows, but nothing of significance happened. The rest of the party has been watching and waiting to determine what they're going to do. And this is where I'm going to stop showing you the details here, because what will happen in the book, again, as you're going through it, 
you will then decide or be uh, need to move to the the second room here which is going to be a grand hall and there will be that description there of it in my case I'm starting to sketch it out here and um, I am going to be populating it with material supplementary material from the books that I showed you I've gotten so far just some dripping water there's a fountain in the middle of the room that is described in the basic description here and uh, my party after continuing their encounter with the goblin is going to be moving into this room here I will tell you that they search for loot and did not find any um, and they'll be moving into this room here to encounter the statue and um, whatever else may be happening in this grand hallway and so you go I mean you're you're going to the book and you're looking up what they're telling you I am adding in a little bit of a story a little bit of something else that is going to be going on um, that I'm not going to get into in the video because it's not related to this basic material but the foundational material is there for to absorb that if you wanted to do that and stay longer in a room or backtrack in some way that isn't part of the pre-programmed material in addition to that material when you finish with that it uh, says to you here the end is just the beginning once you have gone through the pre-programmed material here you can still use this source book to create other dungeon crawls and there are a lot of random tables that are provided for doing that in terms of discovering types of treasure whether or not you populate something with loot and decide how many creatures for example will be appearing in a room so the material throughout if you put it all together will allow you to go on and create other dungeons and other stories using this material and using the uh, little monsters and things that come in here wherever you have your book of spells that you could be continuing to use for example as you leveled up and the second book provides even more things like how to construct a landscape for example and uh, I always find this of interest because instead of just showing up at a dungeon you can get to the dungeon in some way you can create a little bit of a story by situating the dungeon in some type of context and again there is also there are more traps in here more creatures and there is in this second book um, a another pre-programmed adventure that's a landscape one as I said I haven't played this one yet but it begins um, with a trail so that is something a little bit different as an overland I guess it's an overland adventure I don't know but I'm looking forward to getting into that and taking my party there the website has some downloadable material where they put together some of the charts and not all of them though so I this is semi useful um, my one the one challenge for me with the material and I have to work with it a little more to get it set up for what I like to create as some not so much a sequence of play but a sequence a to-do list basically when I'm going into a new area and making sure that I utilize all the the rules for sneaking around for investigating for a trap or for loot or for the actions that I could possibly take I found that spread out a little bit um, not necessarily in a linear fashion in even one one of the books and certainly spread out between the two when I was trying to work with the two of them so I have to pull that together um, a little bit better for myself so that the way that I play when I'm doing this solo I can basically have a checklist and make sure that I am availing myself of all the possibilities for action that exists within the rules because there are quite a few in this and it does provide a nicely three-dimensional experience so that it isn't simply just walking into a room and fighting someone or needing to actually fight someone you are able to use the skills that you have and the attributes they're called the pursuits I guess that you have there is going to be a little bit of I guess self-assessment is the word in terms of whether or not you think what you want to do has a pursuit or a skill that you can add on to it and I guess I didn't even show you I realize now what the basic uh, 
die roll is to accomplish something, you are using something that is called an ability total. So you're taking your ability rating, which is going to be a modifier that you came up with by rolling on the table after you've assigned a value, your pursuit rating and your die roll, and then you are determining whether or not you are successful than whatever the difficulty rating is. And they tell you when a rating is not provided, use the default value of seven. Uh, and then they do in many of the tables provide you with what a default rating might be. So for example here, if we're looking at um, in a ranged attack what the target size of is, it gives you the difficulty rating going down. So obviously a small tiny target is going to have a higher difficulty rating than a huge target and things of that nature. There are some uh, brief examples in terms of how things actually work. It's not if you've played any type of RPG, this mechanism is going to be familiar to you. They give you um, charts that explain what the damage is, and I think everybody starts out with five health. I can't really quite remember that. Um, so that is the basic mechanic. It's a D6, it's a D6 um, system, and pretty simple in that regard. The second book provides a lot of um, external content in terms of providing a bit more of a story. So for example, there are brief rules for creating allies that you can hire basically in a town. Well, the animal companion rule comes in here and that's where I went back and added that in. There are optional rules such as what happens. I always like this. They call it spell feedback here. Not all spells always work and so there are rules here for determining whether or not a spell is actually going to work based on a d6 roll and you can figure out whether you're going to use that, how you're going to use that or not and that gives some flavor to the game and flexibility to the game in terms of what types of um, little add-ons, I guess I'd call them, that you want. So for example, in my case, I've got two wizards and I have decided that one of them is more competent than the other. And I have created a little system for determining whether or not the more, the, the more incompetent one has to roll to see whether his spell has worked or not. This is just something I threw in along the way as I was going. You know, it, it, it changed and it came in uh, because I didn't realize that the rule was quite here. I haven't yet done this yet, but you could use this second book here, Constructing Landscapes. There are, again, a nice, really quick, short D6 table for uh, the type of clearing that you might encounter and what you would find there. This, they give you a sample landscape map. It is some very basic things to stock your landscape with, different types of traps, different types of creatures, how you, um, vegetation that's here. It works really, really well as a, you know, I don't know if they use the word pocket here, but this is like a pocket RPG basically. And uh, as mentioned for me, carrying it back and forth, it's just so easy to carry around with a book and 1D6 that it's a portable system. And um, it does have the makings of something that is a foundation to go back to after you go through the pre-programmed material that is contained in each book and there's two different ones so that's a brief look at ancient odysseys i quite like this the writing is light but the options for adding in detail are pretty rich for such a short rule set i would say that i recommend this if you are drawn to a fantasy theme if you want something either that is an easy step into doing some type of solo RPG where you really don't need more than this. You don't have to use the other material that I showed briefly. You can simply use this both to do the pre-programmed pen and paper dungeon crawl that's in each of the books and also to use that after you have created after you've gone through what's here for you to use that to create your own. It's a great stepping stone into doing solo RPGs. If you do do solo RPGs, it is a, um, a portable system that you can 
easily get into, use some characters, jettison them, create some new characters, do something else, try to do some overland material, and then maybe find your way into a dungeon or a cavern or what have you, and um, spend an hour or so doing that and moving on. So it is um, uh, good for its portability, but it also has a degree of depth that is um, somewhat belied by the shortness of the material. Thanks so much to everyone who has been asking for and showing interest in the solo RPG material that I'm providing here. And um, as always, if you have any suggestions for things that you want covered or seen on the channel, please leave them in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.